morning, everyone, and welcome. Glad to see some familiar uh, faces out there in the chat. I'm Stefan D.W., and welcome to Turnstile Tours virtual session on uh, Kate Walker and the Robins Reef Lighthouse. Uh, before we go any further, those of you who are joining us who prefer to uh, read what's being said, we have closed captioning. You can uh, uh, look in the menu bar and you'll find uh, the closed captioning option. Brian Hoffman is out there today. Uh, he's providing closed captioning for us. And also behind the scenes, we have Doug Chapman producing. And to talk to Doug, you can uh, use the chat function. You'll see that uh, glowing orange in your uh, menu bar. And um, let me stop sharing the screen so we're not looking at that beautiful view for a moment. Uh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, the uh, menu bar should uh, flash orange to tell you there's a chat coming in. Uh, and in chat, you can select either all uh, panelists to just talk to the people behind the scenes, get your questions up to uh, those of us uh, talking here on screen, uh, or you can select all panelists and attendees and talk to everybody else out there. A lot of you have already introduced yourselves. Tell us where you where you are and, and uh, what you're excited about today. And uh, you know, we're here to make community. Turnstile Tours is a, a company that partners with nonprofits to help them build capacity. Uh, people like uh, the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard Development Corporation, and uh, we do tours the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, we partner with the uh, Brooklyn Historical Society. We partner with the Street Vendor Project. And those of you who've been here before have seen the tours we've done uh, of uh, food carts and of uh, Brooklyn locations. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the uh, Prospect Park uh, Alliance and uh, many others as well. Uh, I do want to tell you about some of the upcoming tours we have here uh, and thank you for joining us and hope you'll tell your friends uh, this is keeping us employed, uh, paying the rent. And uh, so if you, if you tell all of your friends about it and they join us, then we'll be able to keep doing this. And if you don't, well, that's a different story. So uh, uh, some of the things your friends might be excited about include tomorrow's program where Doug Chapman will step out from behind the producer's desk. And uh, he's not just a producer, he's also a tour guide and he is uh, our lead. He keeps us all in shape vocally. He's a, uh, an acting coach. And he will talk about uh, voice work for the camera, the Zoom camera in particular. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're excited to see that. That's not tomorrow, but on uh, Thursday. Tomorrow, we are honoring Fleet Week. Uh, we don't have Fleet Week this year again, uh, but uh, we're doing a virtual Fleet Week with Andrew Gustafson uh, and uh, looking at the history of Fleet Week in New York. Uh, and then Friday, we're going to the Moore Street Market in Williamsburg. That's a free program. And uh, we're just going to, we're going to go shopping. We're going to take a tour of this great uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican uh, market in Williamsburg and see all the, 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 uh, the vendors who are there uh, selling incredible food and uh, uh, fascinating cultural items. Uh, Saturday morning, we're doing the Puerto Rican experience revealed through uh, federal records. If you would loved our census program, this is definitely one you want to check out. Uh, Dennis Riley of the uh, New York State Archive will be showing us how federal records can reveal stories, uh, which our guest today, Megan Beck, is familiar with that as a researcher. She knows about these things as well. Uh, Saturday afternoon, Voices of Essex Market will get into a really cool project called Feed Me a Story, where you get to learn other people's secret family recipes. And uh, the Feed Me a Story is a program that does video documentaries asking people, what, what was the first thing you learned to make? Uh, what, uh, what do you remember from your childhood? And we get to experience those, those recipes through this project. Uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, more food. We're looking at eating and translation with uh, Dave Cook. That's the name of his blog. He's a photojournalist, focuses on food, takes people to obscure corners of the five boroughs, including Staten Island, where uh, Megan Beck and the Noble Maritime Collection, which is our focus today, uh, that down there, there's, of course, uh, well known for its Sri Lankan food and, and many other cuisines as well. And uh, to bring it back to uh, the Maritime side, another Maritime Tuesday. Next week, we're exploring the Erie Canal. Uh, professional mariner and uh, the, the man behind the Tugster blog, Will Van Dorp, will take us on a 45-minute trip from uh, Albany to Buffalo on the Erie Canal. 
uh, no promise of mules there. But uh, very excited about these programs and more coming up. And again, uh, with your support, this remains possible. So thank you. And uh, but let's uh, go from here in Flushing, Queens. We're going to go reach all the way over to uh, the North Shore of Staten Island and bring on Megan Beck. And uh, Megan, uh, tell us, uh, introduce us to Kate Walker. Hello. Hi, Stefan. How are you doing? I'm really happy to see you. It's been far too long. It's been far too long, yes. <laughs> it feels good to be talking about, about Kate again. Haven't gotten to do that for a while, so. That's Excellent. Good. Well, uh, yeah, so this is, um, this is, we're talking about Kate Walker and the Robbins Reef Lighthouse. Uh, first of all, before we get into that, why are you talking about Kate Walker? So um, I'm the curator at the Noble Maritime Collection in Staten Island. And um, we are lucky enough to be the stewards of Robin's Reef Lighthouse, um, which was Kate Walker's home for more than three decades. Um, right now we're working on restoring the lighthouse, but um, at the, before we even got into that, we were really fascinated by the story of the woman who lived there. Um, Kate Walker was an immigrant and a single mother who lived and worked at the lighthouse after her husband died and raised her children and her grandchildren and managed to make it a very cozy home um, to the point where she didn't like going to Manhattan or going to the mainland because it was too loud and too crowded and she preferred um, the solitary existence at the lighthouse where she could oh. you know, be with her family, um, listen to her records, read her books um, and do the work that she really enjoyed doing. So we're going to spend most of today talking about Kate, but uh, why, what is the Noble Maritime Collection? Where is it? And why is, is the Noble Maritime Collection interested in Kate? So we um, are located on the grounds of Snug Harbor Cultural Center on Staten Island. Um, we were founded um, to be about the history of local maritime artist Johnny Noble. Um, and then the founding um, director of the museum, Aaron Urban, um, had the opportunity to move the museum from Noble's house to Snug Harbor Cultural Center. I did not um, know it started in his house. It started in his house, yes, wow, on Richmond, on Richmond just, Terrace. So I'm from a native his house, of Staten Island. My first house was right up the hill from uh, John Noble's mm -hmm. house. That's, I had no idea the museum started there. The That's museum started there, it was there for a few years. Um, and then the opportunity came to move the museum to a former dormitory for sailors at Snug Harbor. Um, and John Noble was very involved in the fight to save Snug Harbor at the and time. And there was a dormitory for sailors because Snug Harbor was a, a retirement community, right? It was right? a retirement community for the merchant mariners, primarily. Right. Although if you had any other type of sea service, you were eligible to apply. Um, so it was a way to kind of expand the museum's mission because it was connected to Noble. Um, and so preserving the stories of the people who lived at the harbor and worked at the harbor also became important. And we tell stories of the working waterfront through John Noble's art and through um, the stories of the sailors. So when the opportunity arose to take on Robin's Reef, it was just another way to tell a working waterfront story, a story of um, Kate Walker, who worked in the harbor, um, became very well known by sailors who sailed through the harbor. It's um, called Kate's Light informally uh, by a lot of people. Um, and it was just a way to further expand our mission and to kind of tie all these different um, historical um, things together. That's great. And uh, uh, I, do, I want to address one question in the chat here since it's taking up a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, screen time there. Uh, yes, Dave, that is a turntable in the background behind me. Uh, but also, <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, ask a question I don't know the answer to. Uh, did John Noble ever paint the Robins Reef Lighthouse? So um, we actually have an interesting story about that. When we were putting together um, an exhibition we have at the museum about Kate Walker and about the lighthouse. Um, we, we looked through some of Noble's old sketchbooks because he used to go out in the harbor on his rowboat and um, just kind of sketch what he saw. And in one of his notebooks, we did find a little sketch of Robin's Reef at ah. the time. Yeah, from like the 19, I guess it would be the 30s or 40s. Um, so the Coast Guard would have been living there at the time that that was, that was um, sketched. And we have since found out from Noble's sons that they did row out there periodically and they, they saw the lighthouse up close. 
So he didn't know it was there <laughs> and he did sketch it, which was a nice way to further tie everything together. That's great. Yes. Well, let's uh, get a closer look at the lighthouse ourselves here. I'll uh, bring up your slideshow and we'll take a look and see what that's all about. So here it is in context. We see uh, Lower Manhattan in the distance uh, with, uh, uh, we can see here's a, a bit of the of Brooklyn Bridge here. And I believe this is the uh, power station at 14th Street uh, on the, uh, over in Alphabet City. We've got Governor's Island there. And, uh, and this is back in like 2005, 2006. So things have changed. We now have some much taller buildings over here and, and Long Island City has grown up. Uh, this is actually the view from uh, an apartment I was living in in 2005, just down the street from my childhood home. So I had a similar view if I pressed my face against the window when I was a kid. But uh, uh, anything you want to point out about this photo other than sort of getting people oriented to... Uh, well, yeah, so as you can see, um, Robin's Reef is in the, the, the lower left of the screen, and it is located at kind of the entrance to one of the busiest waterways in the world. It's where um, the Kilvan Cull, which divides um, New York and Staten Island from New Jersey and Upper New York Bay, and just all these waterways kind of coming together. So um, the lighthouse's position there served a very critical part in navigation in the 19th century when, um, when, when this waterway was the busiest waterway in the world. Um, and yeah. it, it was built there because it was it was it marking the channel was it marking a hazard or? well so it was it's very rocky there um which as you know because you've been out there it's yeah. very difficult to pull into the cove by the lighthouse um so it's it's very rocky that area um got its name from the early dutch settlers who named it robin's rift um after the seals that would sun themselves on the rocks. So Robin, um, is, and, Robin is a Dutch word for seal, is that what that is? Uh, yes, correct. Gotcha. Um, so we've, um, we're hoping that as wildlife returns to New York Harbor that we might get to see some seals out there. We did have a volunteer about eight years ago who saw one, um, oh. but that has never happened since. So we're fingers crossed on that one, but um, that's where I got its name. And it was appropriated um, by Congress in 1837 in order huh. to build the lighthouse there to, um, you know, warn sailors about the, the rocky, <laughs> the rocky reef that was there. So we get a couple of questions that come up all the time about the, the lighthouse. And uh, one is, you know, a lot of people think it's abandoned. Uh, people want to know what that object behind it is, and Lewis wants to know, are tours available? So unfortunately, tours are not yet available um, to go out there. That is the long-term plan. Um, but as you can see, it is in the middle of the water, so it is difficult to get out there, and it would be difficult to get large groups of people out there. But we are in the midst of a 15-year restoration plan um, just to shore it up and make sure that it's safe for people to come out there and that's and still a ways away brad uh, 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 amplifies my question so and what's the little as he puts it fortress like thing okay so that is um a sewage outfall from um say county new jersey um putting clean processed water back out into the into the harbor um it was built about 1910 so um kate walker lived there at that time so she would have seen that structure go up Cool. But it is not connected to the lighthouse in any way. And, and the lighthouse is still a functional, automated but functional and important it's, aid to navigation. In fact, uh, yeah, so like we have to deal with the Coast Guard. And I say we because I've been volunteering on the crew that's helped to restore it. But uh, uh, yeah, it's, you a have completely, to deal it's still a completely active guide to navigation. Um, it flashes green every six seconds. Um, and the Coast Guard is in charge of maintaining the light. So we have a partnership with them about that. And uh, even the paint color is a day marker. That's a, yeah, so uh, a, when we uh, get, are able to restore the exterior of the lighthouse, we would have to keep it the colors that it already is because that's how the lighthouse is listed on all Mariner's charts. We're all anxious to do. All right, let's see what else mm -hmm. we got in here. That's a oh. different looking lighthouse there. 
Yes. So this is just to, um, to show the original lighthouse, which was built in 1837 and opened in 1839. It was a granite lighthouse. So all stone painted white um, from um, plans that I've seen of it at the National Archives. It was way more ornate than the current structure. Um, but because granite lighthouses are draftier and more difficult to keep warm, they, um, the government decided to dismantle it after only 40 years. Wow. And the current structure was built in 1883. Um, so the current structure is what Kate Walker lived in. It is what we are trying to preserve now. Uh, I got a question from Lewis that I'm going to answer by uh, stepping over here and grabbing my nautical chart. So. Uh, Lewis wants to know if the uh, there's a restricted zone around the lighthouse. And yeah, of course, I have nautical chart at hand. Uh, Steve, all right. It does not appear there's any kind of official restricted zone around the lighthouse on the chart here. So Lewis wants to know if you can kayak up to it. So. Technically, I mean, yes, we've been, I've been out there and I've seen kayakers come close. Um, so like boats can't get, so there's, um, there's a certain perimeter around the lighthouse where larger vessels can't get too close. Um, but we have seen fishing boats out there and kayaks out there, but the, just to, the lighthouse is private property. Um, so if you want to kayak out to get a closer look, that's great. But um, once you go up that ladder, it's the museum's property. So just and that ladder is sketchy. Go on that up. It. <laughs> it is a questionable ladder. It is. It is yes, it's straight up. So. <laughs> cool. All right. Let's see what else we got here. We're being a little bit slow. There we go. Oh, oh it good. jumped ahead a good amount. Go back. Here we go. Uh, okay, more. so this this is just to show what the lighthouse would have looked like when, when Kate lived there. This photo was taken about 1910. And you can see right here why the lighthouse was necessary <laughs> because at low tide, a beach stretched out from the lighthouse about 100 feet. Wow. So um, it's very, very shallow. Um, it looks like she's got a boat there at the bottom of those davits. Uh, is that how she got to and from the lighthouse? Yes, in a small little dory. Um, it's the only boat she had. Um, wow. there, were, there are three ladders on the exterior of the lighthouse. Two of them kind of lined up with where the davits were. So she could kind of lean to attach the boat um, to the, the police to pull it up. And then another ladder, which you can climb, which I have photos of later. So you'll get to oh, see cool. That. Yeah, and those davits are the things that kind of hang out over the side. That the, uh, hang out over the side on the right-hand side. You can see that. And then gotcha. on the left-hand side, there's that little, like, kind of house that's yeah, kind of hanging on the side. Um, we believe that that was for, like, flammable materials, like paint and oils and gas, to have them outside of the, the home. Because so it was, no it was the home. What? Not an outhouse. No, as far as we know, Kate Walker was a chamber pot person. So, gotcha. <laughs> Let's see if my computer will advance with us here. There we go. All right, there she is. So there is Kate Walker. Um, she was born in Germany um, in 1848, and um, by the mid 1870s, she was married and had a son named Jacob. Um, and shortly after that, um, her first husband passed away. So in 1882, she moved to America with her son. Um, she settled in Sandy Hook, New Jersey, where she got a job at an officer's quarters. And um, there is where she met John Walker, um, who I think we have a- There we go. Yes. And uh, Pat wants to know, does that beach still show up? Um, to an extent, it does. So originally, the reef, um, like the rock formation that comes out from the lighthouse was in a straight line, kind of following um, where that beach you see was. Now it's more in an L shape, huh. which um, we'll have photos of a little bit later. So they changed the formation of the reef. So there is still a beach that shows up at low tide, but it's not as extensive as the one that was seen in that photograph. Um, well, all right, so here, here it is. 
So uh, here's John have... Walker. So Kate Walker met him at um, the officer's quarters in Sandy Hook. At the time, he was the keeper of Sandy Hook Lighthouse. Um, he was a Swedish um, captain. Um, but, and although he didn't speak English very well himself, he gave her English lessons and they met and that's how they met and that's how they got to know each other. And they married um, two years later in 1884. And then shortly after that, he was transferred out to the new lighthouse at Robins Reef. Um, so she had loved living at Sandy Hook. She could have a garden, she could go for walks, she could have a pet if she wanted to have a pet. Um, but when they got the news that they had to move out to Robin's Reef, it was so isolated. And the thought of being just stuck out there in the middle of the harbor, just she was not a fan. <laughs> um, so here you see um, her son, Jacob. Um, once he was old enough, um, he did end up working at the lighthouse with her. Um, and on the right is her daughter, Mary, or May. She was actually born at the lighthouse in 1886. Wow. Um, it was the same year that the Statue of Liberty opened. So just for a point of reference of what was going on in the harbor at that time. Wow. Um, so um, Kate Walker um, took over as keeper of the lighthouse because John died of bronchopneumonia in 1890. Um, it was very sudden um, and he, um, the, his last words to her were to mind the light. So she took that very seriously. Um, and she worked at the lighthouse and she stayed there for the next four years, even after she was told by the lighthouse department that she had to vacate. She was like, no, I'm going to work that I'm going to do this job. Um, they offered the job to several men who turned it down. And in 1894, she was finally appointed assistant, like temporary keeper. And uh -huh. then in 1895, she was finally given the job after four and a half years of doing it. Um, Is that unusual for uh, a lighthouse keeper's wife to take or widow to take over? It's actually not as uncommon as you would think. A lot of the um, early female lighthouse keepers were women who took over for their husbands. Um, and although Kate Walker wasn't the first woman to be a keeper of an offshore lighthouse, she was the only woman at that time on the entire eastern seaboard to be in charge of such a lighthouse. Um, and, and in a very significant place, you know, the center of the busiest harbor in the world yes, at that it time. Was very busy. <laughs> um, so after her husband's death and after she was finally appointed the job, um, her son became her um, assistant, uh, uh, official assistant, and her daughter lived out there. Her son would do primarily be the one to run the errands on the mainland, and there he met his wife, and they got married, and they had five kids, and for a while the whole family lived at the lighthouse. Wow. Um, so, it, so in the upper left here, you see four of the, four of the grandchildren. Um, the oldest grandchild actually um, died in an accident at the lighthouse when she was five years old. Um, but the, um, the other four were raised there. They grew up there. Um, they loved it out there. They could go swimming. They learned how to swim on the beach. <laughs> they felt they had their own private beach. And even despite the isolation, Kate Walker was able to have a pretty active social life. Um, people would come out to visit her. They had, she had friends out on the mainland, um, some of whom you can see in these, in these photos. The one on the right is an, a full-fledged party that they had out on the lighthouse. Um, this photo was taken down um, on the beach. And, um, but she, they, people normally came to her. She didn't usually go to the mainland too much. <laughs> You know, this keeps reminding me of uh, the Waterfront Museum, which is a place I know and love uh, over on the other side of the harbor in Red Hook. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave Sharps, uh, David Sharps, who uh, who saved that barge and uh, raised his family out there, has a very similar experience. He doesn't go into Manhattan, you know, mm -hmm. if he can at all avoid it, he rarely leaves the barge. You know, his kids had this weird rural upbringing in the center of New York City. Um, so... Yeah, it's uh, the harbor has some significant consistencies. Uh, one question from Elaine, could uh, Kate's husband, the lighthouse keeper, could he have been a victim of the flu epidemic of 1889-1890? I suppose that's possible. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I do know that his official cause of death was bronchopneumonia. Um, so it's, it's always possible. He, um, he did do the errands to the mainland. He would have had to go back and forth to get mail and, and some supplies that weren't delivered um, by the lighthouse department. So it's definitely possible, um, but I don't know that for a fact.
And and Lewis here uh, has heard some stories. He wants to know: Is it true that she wrote that Kate? Wrote I know where this story? is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she. Um, it is true to a point. We do know that she did row her kids back and forth to school sometimes. It was not every day. Um, some of the people in these photos, um, like in the one on the lower left, um, the woman standing directly next to Kate, who is all the way on the right, um, she's Esther Olson. Her family ran a hotel in St. George on Staten Island. And we know that that is where um, Jacob, Kate's son, would stay um, overnight on the mainland. We know that that's where he met his wife. Um, we know that the kids would board there um, during mm. school time. Mm. So um, it's more likely that Kate would row them to school on Monday, they would stay on the mainland, and then they would come back for the weekend. Um, it's still pretty great. <laughs> yes, and she was, especially because she was a very small woman. She was only four feet, 10 inches, which, which did play a part uh -huh. in why the Lighthouse Department didn't want to give her the job. They didn't think someone that small, um, she was under 100 pounds, would be able to do the kind of rigorous work that was required of a lighthouse keeper out in the middle of New York Harbor. <laughs> um, but she proved them wrong. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, sort of a detailed note here from Dave. Uh, it says, it looks like the dredgings must have left the land bridge there. In 1914, the Ambrose Channel was dug through to 40 feet deep and 2,000 feet wide. And during World War II, it was dredged to 45 feet. Of course, these, these photos are, are much earlier than that. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there was a, or for the World War II at least, and even earlier than the Ambrose Channel uh, dredge of 1914, but there was, it was always shallow there. You know, there, do you, uh, I don't recall, do you have a, a map in here? We, we you have had a, a map of the uh, like colonial era. Uh, there's like a very early chart yeah, that you it showed was, me at one it point. it was very shallow. Um, so, I mean, how shallow it is has obviously changed over time because sure. it's not that as shallow now the, the that much of a beach doesn't show now um but in that previous photo of the party you can see a lot of debris around yeah. the base of the lighthouse and some of that is from the original structure when it was dismantled they just kind of pushed a lot of it off the side so even the, now the if you, yeah like the big granite blocks and there's like piping that we see there and some of i think sometime when they just took the lighthouse apart or took pieces off um to we do something they would just dump it over the side and it would become part of the reef um so you can see like what those people are, are standing on at the bottom of the lighthouse some of that are granite blocks from the original lighthouse wow. so do you have any have you any evidence about dredgings being tossed in that area or is that uh, not something you've heard about that's not something i've specifically heard about no okay. That was an interesting idea, but and yeah, it's a, that's its own remarkable story, the dredging of Ambrose Channel. That's a, it's a whole other session. So what are we looking at here? Oh, so this is um, Kate Walker's sitting room. This would have been on the second floor of the lighthouse. It's just to give you an idea of how she managed to make these very small rooms very homey. Um, you can see that there's beautiful furniture, there's dolls, there's framed photographs. She even has a framed photo of the lighthouse um, on the wall. Oh. Um, and this is where she would um, write in her log book, which was one of the most important jobs she had as a lighthouse keeper. Um, there's another photo next of, oh, yeah. um, and of her of course bedroom. Yeah, the, the challenge here is it's, it's all slightly awkward. You have these big square pieces of furniture in this, in this, this round circular wall. room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, even now, looking at this bed, it just like it doesn't feel, having stood in that room, it doesn't feel like it should have fit. <laughs> um, but somehow it did. So this would have been the third story of the lighthouse. Um, there are six stories all together. The first floor in Kate's time was the kitchen. The second was the sitting room. The third was her bedroom. The fourth is subdivided to smaller rooms. We like to think that that's where the kids slept, but um, we have no way of knowing that for sure. Um, the fifth um, floor is the watch gallery. So the ceiling of the watch gallery, there's um, windows in the floor so you could see up to where the lantern is That's and um, on the watch yeah. gallery you can go outside on the balcony um, and get a beautiful view of New York Harbor and then the lantern gallery is where the light is and at Kate's time it would have been very hot up there because she was using um, gasoline and it's just all windows 
So um, he would watch the light from the watch gallery through the floor to make sure that it was still functioning properly. So nice in the winter, warm yourself up around that, uh, that fire and the light, but uh, maybe tough in the summer. Yeah, in the summer, oh, you don't want to go up there. <laughs> Let's see. And we've got these pipes going through the space. And yes, um, some of them were from the stove pipes. Um, she had a stove on her um, on the first floor in the kitchen, and it would exhaust up at the top. Um, so there's Kate climbing the the ladder. Um, this is not the ladder we have to climb up now. <laughs> um, we have a more modern right. ladder for us to climb. But um, this this one, it just went right to the boat. You'd have to get off the boat onto this ladder to go up. Um, so that's why there's that elaborate ladder pulley system to hook up with the boat first. Then you have to get over to this ladder, go up, and then pull the boat up so it's out of the water. Wow. Um, yeah, and you can see there how small she is. She's only like four rungs tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on the right, she's filling the, the gas lanterns um, for, the, for the light. It was this complicated apparatus um, that... Um, that rotated. So it had eight lamps that she would have to fill. Um, and then there was this weight and pulley system that would rotate it around. And as it flipped around, that's when it would flash the light. So now it's green. At one time it was white, but it's been green for a very long time. Um, and she would um, have to fill the lamps down downstairs and bring it all the way up. Um, uh, don't trip. Boy. What a trek. Yeah. She would If she had a Fitbit, she would have been good on steps. <laughs> Um, she would, uh, um, and the lights had to be, um, rewound every five hours, but she would wind it every three hours just to make sure that it never disappointed sailors who depended on it. But sometimes things went wrong. And when things went wrong, she would have to go from the light all the way up to all the way down into the cellar where there was this foghorn machinery, which she would have to, um, I think I have a photo of that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's check that um, out. But did she sleep? How, that just sounds exhausting. She did that she every barely day. Sleeps. Yeah, the um the photo of her bedroom is from a 1905 New York Times profile on her, and the um the caption of that photo is where Kate Walker sleeps but never slumbers. Ah, that's beautiful. And I thought that was great because her her job was a 24 hour job, so it, the most important like you know, obviously important part was keeping the light going. So that's a night gig, but all day. So here she's writing in her log book. Um, is, Christmas, is that a tiny uh, Charlie Brown Christmas tree on the window? It certainly looks like it could be. <laughs> um, so she had to keep detailed notes of things that she saw in the harbor, um, her chores. She had to keep the lighthouse shining bright with white paint um, and with, um, kerosene things could get very very dirty so she had to clean um, she had to you know if in the middle of winter if it was really cold and icy she had to climb out through this little tiny dog door um, outside the lantern gallery and scrape ice off the windows um, so it was oh, a very wow. physically taxing job so but it here was on the left, was it kerosene uh, or gasoline that they it, were using what, in both it was both while she was there she went she oh, wow. saw it transition um, but she, so if the, um, the light stopped working, she would have to go all the way down to the basement, to the cellar, and use and wind this foghorn machinery, wow. which would then toot out a, a horn every three seconds. And then on the off chance that also broke, she would have to go all the way back up to the watch gallery, go out on the balcony and hammer on a bell until, until help would come. So those wow. are the, those oh, so are the, the bell was like, you're really in trouble and you need more yeah, assistance. Like you heard that hammering. Wow. So the, um, the nearest lighthouse depot was in Tompkinsville on Staten Island. But, and so that was the one for the whole country, right? That might have been, I think that was the main one as well. And it happened to be her local, right. um, her local branch. Yeah. But um, they would have to come out and she did see them periodically that she would have to turn over her log books every month. Um, and they were subpoenaed sometimes if there was, you know, a crash out in the harbor. Sure. Um, and she would have, they would take her logbooks to see if she documented it and she could be instrumental in deciding who was at fault. Um, she would see um, only once a year, she was delivered her yearly rations of coal. Um, there, was a, there was a coal um, chute 
that, um, in, the, in the cellar. So they would kind of take it from the boat directly into the cellar. Um, and there was a rotating um, lighthouse department library that would come. She would always get excited when that would show up. She liked to uh, read. A, a, a bookmobile, but a boat. Basically, a it was a, like a floating library. That's fantastic. Um, and was that Stevens Church or was that USCG? It was the lighthouse, lighthouse department. Lighthouse so when she department. when she was there, it was before the lighthouse department was absorbed right. into the Coast Guard. Right. Um, so on the right, she's making um, coffee. I would we hope know, so. Um, from her descendants that she loved coffee and that um, it probably helped her get through her very, very long day, Good every job. day. Um, she also, um, she liked to read. And although she did speak English and she conducted all of her um, light house business in English. She did like to read in German whenever possible. So her personal books tended to be in German. Um, and she did, um, she loved music. So she had an old Victrola and she would listen to records. Um, so that's kind of how she relaxed when she did get to relax. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot to do out there. It is pretty isolated, which is great. But um, as we all know now, isolation can be challenging. Right. Um, and as um, an, a government employee, she, she had to fly a flag over the lighthouse um, at all times. There was a flagpole, um, and that's her little grandson um, watching her do that, Jacob uh, Jr. Um, so then, Joanne says uh, it's impressive she had any time to read with all her responsibilities. Oh, yeah. She had a rocking chair. She would sit out on the on the the case on and read whenever she could. Um, probably not very often. And there were so many kids running around. There's <laughs> no peace and quiet. <laughs> um, so by 1919, so she had officially taken the job in 1895, but she'd been out there since 1886. 1919, she's forced into retirement by a new government law, which says that all lighthouse keepers have to retire by the age of 70. And she was already 71. Huh. So she had um, about a month to kind of get her affairs in order and, and vacate. Her son um, replaced her as keeper for the next few years. So she did still have a connection to the lighthouse for a while. Um, but she moved to Tompkinsville on Staten Island where her daughter, May, um, lived with her and took care of her. She finally got to... Um, have a dog. She always loved animals, and there's a famous yeah, story where she, yeah. where she rescued. she rescued. This is her dog in Tompkinsville. This is her dog in Tompkinsville, um, and she um, is known for saving sailors at sea. But her favorite rescue was a little Scotty dog that she got to take care of for a week. Um, so she always wanted to have a dog. So in retirement, she got to have one. And um, she lived in Tompkinsville, and she would go down to the water and look out at the lighthouse. Um, you know, she, she loved it there, it was her home. Um, and then she passed away in 1931 and she was memorialized in newspapers all over the country, but in New York, they wrote a lot of wonderful, wonderful obituaries about her and honoring her life's work. And, and how many lighthouse keepers uh, were there at Robin's Reef after her? Um, uh, there were, I wanna say about 10, no one had her tenure. Um, and then the Coast Guard took over. So then in um, 1939, the Coast Guard absorbed the Lighthouse Department. Um, so there were crews of three men, two Coast Guardsmen and one civilian keeper. And those three men did the work that she did almost entirely by herself. Wow. And they would only be out there in tours of six or seven months at a time. And then they'd be rotated out. So she, she lived there for 33 years, and that is by far the longest anyone ever lived at Robin's Reef. <laughs> Nobody came close. I love these guys. They're, they're either really brilliant actors or just extraordinary characters. I love their faces. <laughs> they're just like, why are you taking a picture of me? <laughs> um, so yeah, so the Coast Guard lived there from 1939 until 1966, when the lighthouse was sealed and fully automated. So um, Robin's Reef remains an active guide to navigation. It still has its green light that flashes every six seconds, but, um, the co uh, but we own it now and we partner with 
the Coast Guard who goes in periodically to check on it to make sure everything is, is functioning as it should. People in the chat were talking about winter and how icy it was and climbing the ladder when it's coated with ice. And, uh, yes, there's a, there, there's a story of a Christmas that Kate Walker spent all alone at the lighthouse because her kids and her grandkids were on the mainland probably getting food, seeing friends before they came back for Christmas dinner. Um, but a storm rolled in and there was ice, like a little mini icebergs all over the harbor and she knew that they weren't going to be able to make it back. And she's inside, there's a noise and she thought her boat had come loose. So she goes outside and she's like, she has to like crawl against the wind over to her boat. And there's like a chain flying around and it hits her in the eye and it was all icy. Um, so yeah, in, in the winter time, it would have been extraordinarily treacherous out there and even more isolating than it was in the nice weather because you couldn't go anywhere. There were a couple years there, I think it was 1918 or 1917, that the harbor froze so solid that uh, anything, everything west or east of the harbor, there was a major fuel crisis because the uh, the coal boats couldn't get across. Or yeah, to in Brooklyn. we do have some um, old like letters that she had written to the Lighthouse Department um, that I think they were dated 1916 or 1917, where um, there were boats that had washed up against the reef, but they had been just carried there by ice. Um, wow. because their anchors were still down. Wow. Um, yes, yeah, so it was extraordinarily treacherous out there in the winter. Uh, Dave wants to know if uh, you know whether she logged the arrival of the Carpathia on April 18th, 1912. I assume that's a reference to the, uh, the Titanic. Is that correct? Um, so I would say that if a boat came through New York Harbor, she probably made a note of it. But um, unfortunately, most of her logbooks and records have been lost. There were several fires at government facilities that held records, one in the 1920s, one in the 1970s. Um, when I went to the National Archives to do research, some of the stuff that they gave to me was like charred, like smelled of fire. Um, wow. So there wasn't much for me um, to look at when I went down there. So unfortunately, none of her logbooks exist. But um, she was a meticulous record keeper. So chances are if a big flashy boat <laughs> and ship came into New York Harbor, she probably made a note of it. Yeah, that was, that was the, uh, he's referring to the Carpathia's arrival with the survivors of the Titanic. So that first photo we had from the, uh, uh, at the head of the show, that was taken from this window right over here. So uh, that's Hamilton Avenue coming down to, uh, uh, yep, you can see the baseball stadium in the background and uh, uh, yeah, this is, this is quite a photo. That's Yeah, so uh, this photo is from about 2010, shortly before um, the Noble Maritime Collection got stewardship of the lighthouse. Uh, um, so yeah, so you can see that even from the photo at the top of the show, there's this little, the white of the lighthouse starting to get dirty um, and it's rusting. Um, it's even um, more extreme now. But- Except uh, for that the black and the white above the, uh, that balcony. They both yes, look great. I, I, there's a photo of that that we can show people. Excellent. Um, so oh, wow. working on it. So I just wanted to give you guys just a quick glimpse into some of the restoration that we've done. So this is the second floor of the lighthouse. If you remember Kate's sitting room, with the beautiful mirror and the dolls. This is this room. Um, this is what it looked like, um, I mean, after we cleaned it, but before it got a fresh coat of paint. Um, and then in the next photo, you can see oh, um, wow. what we've done to it. So, um, no window. Gonna, so without a window, this is in the middle of the window restoration. So we had a master carpenter come who removed all the original windows. They had been sealed up um, on the outside with just steel and plywood on the inside. So we had to take those off, get the windows out. Um, they were meticulously restored and then they were reinstalled. Um, so you can actually see that next. So this is, these are the steel that was outside. Um, and yeah, so every window was covered in, in steel. And this is a good time to talk about uh, Sandy. You know, anytime we talk about the waterfront, we got to talk about uh, uh, two things. One is sewage and the other one is, is Superstorm Sandy. So we've talked about sewage. Let's talk about Sandy. So Hurricane Sandy did set back the restoration um, significantly. So um, this bigger seal um, cover on the left um, covers a door. The door was not original. It was put there by the Coast Guard. 
um, who put a bathroom with, with plumbing and running water outside on the, on the caisson. Um, we have since covered, sealed this opening back up and installed bricks on the inside to put Kate's pantry back. She had had a pantry there. But um, this was a door until last year and Hurricane Sandy blew it in completely. Um, ripped up the floor, dislodged granite steps on the other side of the lighthouse where the main entrance is, um, flooded the cellar, destroyed a lot of equipment. So it, um, but we're lucky there were lighthouses that were completely ripped off their foundations. And on the one hand, this doesn't face the Verrazano Narrows. It's not like it's got a straight shot from the water, but the wind was coming over Brooklyn. So this is kind of facing like Manhattan. This, this side, it's facing more like Brooklyn, Governor's Island, that direction. Right which is where the wind was coming from. And yes. uh, you know, but it, but it again, blew but in that door and it was a big metal storm door. So that was not easy. <laughs> yeah. And so if you were closer to Brooklyn, it, well, you were somewhat sheltered by Brooklyn, but on this side of the harbor, it had the wind had all that space across the harbor to build up waves and boy, it really built up. Yeah. The big we, we looked out though, because there were lighthouses that were completely destroyed. I'm looking on the right side there, and is that the teardrop memorial, the 9-11 memorial over in Bayonne? Um, I can't see you. I see me. Uh, yes, it is. Right here. Yes, it is. Now, we've talked about that, that little spit of land there. There's uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, of course, is a place we talk about a lot. And just behind the lighthouse on the left, there's, uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, uh, there's a, a shipyard, a, uh, which was an auxiliary shipyard for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They still have an active dry dock over there, which I believe is still a military site. Oh, look at that. And then that's wow. the newly restored window. Yes, yeah, so um, the museum's founder, uh, Aaron Urban, leads intrepid groups of volunteers out there in the good weather to, including Stefan here, to do um, projects out there. They've really done um, amazing, amazing work. Um, just from everything from yeah. scraping to painting. Yeah, so um, both Stefan and I have been on ladders propped up in these stairwells painting um, just to make everything. Ladders are us. That's what it's all about. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the goal is just to get everything gleaming white with paint as it, as it was in Kate Walker's time with white paint. Um, it's truly a, a, lab a labor of love, <laughs> um, it really is, it? but it's, it's, it's a... really coming together. And here, this is a photo taken towards the end of the last season out the lighthouse, so about last October. Um, you can see that the top sections of the lighthouse um, that are white and black with the railings, all of that is freshly painted. Um, so it really gleams and it stands out in a way that the rest of the lighthouse will hopefully one day soon. Um, but it's exciting to think about what the lighthouse will look like with a fresh coat of paint. Is it really? Yeah, no, you've seen some great uh, diagrams or drawings in your uh, uh, renderings in, in the museum of like ideas about restoring that that uh, that uh, porch roof that you see. Mm -hmm. Really cool ideas, and just a matter of getting people out there. Uh, Miller's launch, the uh, the great tugboat company based there in uh, uh, in Staten Island, uh, right by uh, right around the corner from Staten Island Ferry. They've been great about taking Aaron Urban and the crews out there. Cheryl wants to know, is it possible for the general public to volunteer with the restoration? Um, yeah, if you're interested in um, learning more about the restoration or to try to get involved, you can, um, we can share and I'll type it in the chat, a general email address. Um, that you can send inquiries to and they'll be passed along. So um, make sure you send that to all attendees as well as panelists. Yeah, um, Erin Urban um, is retired from the museum, but she is still in charge of this restoration. So if you, you can email your information to this, let me make sure I'm typing that in our agenda over here, um, to this general um, email address, um, we can pass along your information to the appropriate people. Um, we're always looking for volunteers with skills that um, could be helpful to the project. I um, mean, as you can see here, um, there aren't really railings <laughs> around the, the caisson, so it's not exactly the safest place to bring large groups of people. So crews are very small, no more than six. Um, but, and we also, um, you can't get large boats out there. I mean, that's a big restriction. We always yes. have to like, check it's the tide and they come in very and carefully, very skilled uh, mariners there at, at uh, Miller's Launch. 
Well, uh, yeah, and, it, um, and about Miller's Lunch, I mean, they make this whole project possible. They really do. Um, taking Aaron and volunteers out there and um, donating their time and their expertise and their help, it's really, truly um, invaluable help. Yeah, yeah they're, they're tremendous. But this is such a fantastic view. You can see it looks like mostly this is an angle looking at it. We've got some Jersey City going on here, I think. Uh, I'm not sure we quite get into Manhattan from this angle, but uh, well, and you can see that the reef is of an L shape. It's kind of distorted from this angle, but it's a very different um, looking reef than the historical reef, which just came out in like a straight line. Cool. I think that's the last photo. So let's mm -hmm. uh, come back and talk face to face here. Uh, this was fantastic, Megan. I, uh, you know, I'm deeply passionate about the about the Noble Maritime Collection and about uh, the lighthouse, and, uh, and I'm a huge fan of Erin's and love the work she does. And, and uh, uh, I do hope that everyone watching today got uh, you know, got their appetites whetted and are ready to roll up their sleeves and uh, get a little uh, lighthouse paint on them. And, uh, and also check out the uh, Noble Maritime Collection. We should do a whole other piece about uh, John Noble because he's an <laughs> incredible character. Um, we do have a book about the lighthouse, um, which gives a very detailed description of every single floor in more detail than I could have gone into today. So if um, people are interested in learning um, just more about the history of the lighthouse, more about um, history of Kate Walker, um, there's a lot more detail in this book, which is available through our website. And, uh, so, and the museum, I assume, is closed right now and uh, yeah. yeah. So in Snug Harbor, that's um, what's uh, they're they're involved in the COVID nineteen response, aren't they? It's like a um, testing. Site? There is a testing facility set up there. Um, due to its proximity to um the hospital, uh, um yeah. So Snug Harbor is being used for that. The park is still technically open to visitors who want to walk around, um, but you know, all the buildings are closed. For a while. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you uh, giving us a little window into a world that's uh, uh, you know right there, right by the Staten Island Ferry. You see it passing by all the time, but it's not a place people get into very often. And, and Kate Walker's story is just tremendous. Uh, I I know there were there were plans to build a statue honoring her. I hope those uh, you know survive our current. Yes, uh, she was the first Staten Islander selected um, as part of the the Mayor She Built NYC initiative to have a statue built in her honor. Um, the plan was to have it um, near the Staten Island Ferry in St. George along the waterfront in view of her lighthouse. Um, as of now, I assume that's still going forward, but I'm sure it will be delayed. Um, as I know, the last I heard, they hadn't selected an artist yet. So. Well, uh, here's hoping we don't have too much uh, more of a delay on getting that exterior painted. Got to Got to save the outside to keep the inside whole and, uh, and preserve all the great work you've done. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Any last words before we let you go, Megan? Oh, I just want to thank everyone for joining and listening. Um, you can feel free to share my email address if people want have questions. I'm always happy to talk about Kate Walker. Um, I can, they can find you through the info at Noble Maritime. You can too. find me through the info. Um, that, uh, that can get to me. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to answer any further questions that people think of later. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for joining us. It was really good to see you. And uh, thank you, everyone out there, for joining us again. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to continue with the maritime theme. Uh, we're celebrating Fleet Week virtually, uh, since we're not going to be out in the streets filled with sailors and, and Marines and so forth. Uh, so uh, uh, Andrew Gustafson will tell us about the history of Fleet Week. Uh, then Thursday, public speaking with Doug Chapman, who's been back there producing this, doing a great job keeping this going. Uh, uh, so how to, how to do what we do, but even better, uh, public speaking for Zoom. Doug Chapman will be telling us then a uh, free program on Friday, looking at the Moore Street Market in Williamsburg. And uh, we'll be continuing with the Maritime theme again Tuesday, one week from today, with Will Van Dorp, uh, another Staten Islander, uh, and uh, the, the guy behind Tungster Blog, uh, talking about uh, uh, taking us on a tour of the Erie Canal. So do uh, go to uh, the Turnstile Tours website, check out the programs, support this work. This is keeping uh, food on the table for folks. And, and uh, we, without you, uh, we, we'd be in a very different situation. So uh, bring the community together and, and make this happen. Thank you for joining us. 
we will see you next time. Bye, Megan. Bye. <laughs>